Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be repairing and upgrading this iMac that was donated to me by a viewer. It was described as having a graphics card fault, but was still turning on. I knew nothing else about the computer other than that. After receiving it, it looks to be in good condition other than the obvious display issue. It does have some grime around the ports and power button area, but I should be able to take care of that. Along with the iMac came an Apple keyboard, mouse, and trackpad. The viewer who wished to remain anonymous also had a few other broken Apple devices, including two Mac Pro towers. As they lived in Western Australia, I couldn't pick them up, so I struck a deal with my mate Nathan. If he could pick up the stuff, he could keep the Mac Pros and anything else if he posted that iMac to me. He was in, and I received the iMac as well as two other boxes of miscellaneous items, some of which Nathan threw in. Included was two Wacom tablets, a headphone stand, hard drive enclosure, router, Nexus tablet, peripherals, and some zip disks. Plugging in the iMac, we can diagnose it further. While I cannot make out 98% of the display, I can still see the cursor and time at the top of the display. To me, it doesn't look like a graphics card has failed, but the display panel itself. To test my theory, I'll attach a monitor to the iMac. I picked up this Thunderbolt display recently and decided to test it out on this iMac. Sure enough, I was right. The external monitor displays correctly, indicating the graphics card is working. And I also know my new monitor works, although it has its own issues I need to take care of. Along with the repairs, I'll also be upgrading this computer with an SSD, an extra few sticks of memory, and an Intel Core i7. It's time we got inside the iMac, and to do that, all I need to do is lift up on the display glass. This is the very last iMac model that opens this way. All the newer, thinner models have their display glued in place. Under the glass is the LCD itself. It's held in place with eight screws that need to come out before we can access any of the internals. We'll also need to disconnect four cables running to the display before it can be detached from the iMac. The internal design of this iMac not only looks nice, but it's modular and upgradable. Something kept through the entire lineup of Intel iMacs. Although, you can forget about any of that upgradability with the new M1 iMac. This particular model can have its CPU, GPU, RAM, hard drive, Wi-Fi card, and DVD drive upgraded. Before jumping to conclusions about the display, I wanted to try a new display cable. It's possible someone opened up the computer and damaged this cable. After all, it's looking a bit creased. I didn't have a direct replacement, but an extension cable that will do the job. A replacement cable will be a lot cheaper than having to change the whole screen. The black tape from the display will need to be peeled back in order to reveal the connector. After attaching the test cable, the display can be connected back onto the computer for testing. After powering on the computer, you can see the display exhibits the same issues as before. With the cable not the culprit, I'll need to replace the whole display. $108 later, I had a used one. There was no images of it turned on, and with only one poor photo of it, I didn't really have any idea on what condition it was in. Pulling it out, it looks great with no scratches. It even came with its mounting hardware and cabling, so it'll be a direct replacement. I'll test fit the screen to make sure it and the iMac is working before proceeding to complete any of the upgrades. Firing up the iMac, you can see it now displays the correct image and we can actually see what's going on on the computer. From here, I'm going to remove the screen we just attached and begin upgrading the iMac. I'll start by removing the logic board first so we can upgrade the CPU, but also replace the thermal paste for both the CPU and GPU modules. To get the logic board out, I'll firstly remove the RAM door and the RAM modules themselves.
Next, the DVD drive is to come out. It's secured with four screws and two cables, one of which is a temperature sensor. This iMac has many of them, and if one is absent, it can cause the fans to spin at full speed all the time. So it's important to keep them intact and reconnect them when we reassemble the device. After the right fan is detached, all of the cables connecting to the logic board can be unplugged. Not all of them disconnect in the same way, so it's important not to force any, as you could break off their socket from the board and no longer be able to attach the cable back. After everything's disconnected, we'll need to take out the infrared module that sits behind the Apple logo. The last thing left to detach is the three cables going to the Wi-Fi card. Now it's time to remove the power supply. It's completely exposed unlike many other desktop computers. So one wrong move and you could electrocute yourself. If the computer is still plugged in or the mains capacitor is still holding a charge. So always proceed with caution. After removing the four screws, both the output and mains input wires will need to come out before the board is free. Proceeding, we can now remove the seven torque screws holding the logic board in place. The main board sits behind the front chin, so it'll need to be worked loose before it can be lifted part way out. There are still several cables for power, the hard drive and optical drive still attached to the other side. Now we can get a good look at the logic board. There are three SATA ports, labeled HDD, ODD and SSD. Models configured with an SSD also supported a second hard drive. That's why there are three SATA ports. Although mine didn't ship with an SSD or have two drives from the factory, the port is still present and with the right cable, it can be used. Now we can focus on upgrading the CPU. To get at it, the heatsink needs to come off. The four screws that surround the CPU socket attach to another set of four on the other side. To get them out, you need to hold the adjacent screw while loosening, similar to if there was a nut on the back. With the heatsink removed, the old thermal compound can be removed from the copper heat pad. This is also a good time to clean out the heatsink fins, although mine were completely spotless. With that, it's time for our new CPU. I'll be installing the fastest supported in this machine, the Intel Core i7-2600S. I purchased it used, and it shows. There is thermal paste on the underside covering some pads and components. I want to remove all these prior to installing the CPU, otherwise it might not work at all. Using a tissue and a brush, I was able to remove the mess. It's now time to remove the Intel Core i5-2400S. I'll wipe off the thermal paste prior to removing it, just so I don't make a mess. After unlatching the lever, the old CPU can be removed and replaced with the Core i7. I'll now apply some thermal paste as outlined in the official guide. With that, all that we need to do to complete this CPU upgrade is to reattach the heatsink. I will loosely attach all screws before tightening them down. This is to prevent uneven pressure on the CPU, which could cause damage. After it's attached, I'll reconnect its sensor cable and proceed to the GPU. It can also be upgraded, but is a costly upgrade at around $200. So instead, I'll just be replacing its thermal paste to help keep it running. Its heatsink attaches in the same way as the other did. The card itself needs to be removed, otherwise the screws just spin freely and don't come out. With the heatsink properly removed, we can get a good look at our graphics card. This is the AMD Radeon 6750M. I'll remove the dry, crusty paste from the GPU die before applying a dot of new paste. Before we can attach the heatsink though, we'll need to remove the old thermal paste from it as well. Once that's been done, the two can be reattached together.
With that, the graphics card can be reattached to the logic board and fastened with its three screws and one sensor cable. Before I get that logic board back into position, I want to clean out the remainder of the fans inside the iMac. There are two left inside the housing that are secured in place with Torx screws. After I get them out, I'll be able to clean them with a brush to remove any dust and debris inside. There was minimal dust for a computer of this age, and certainly less than what I found in my last iMac. It was so clogged that I was surprised the fans even span. After all three fans inside the iMac have been cleaned, it's time for reassembly. Two of the three fans will need to be put back into place before I can install the logic board. The lower left fan has a few cables that clip onto it, so it's important that they're properly cable managed before it's screwed into place. Now I can install the logic board. It's a bit difficult to connect the cables that attach to the rear as they're quite short. However, once they're attached, the board can be positioned back into place. Be sure not to trap any cables below the board, as not only will you not be able to attach them, but they could get damaged if they get jammed in the wrong place. I will reattach all of the screws prior to connecting the flex cables that attach to the board. I am very tempted to pick up a 2019 iMac and completely spec it out put a large SSD in it, max out the RAM and CPU. It would be costly and a bit more nerve wracking as the display is glued in place, but once it's open, it wouldn't be any harder than this one. It's time for the right hand fan to be reinstalled. After attaching its flex cable, it can be positioned into place and fastened with its one screw. After the antenna wires for the Wi-Fi card are attached, the power supply is to go in next. After its cables have been plugged in, I can reinstall the four screws. Before reinstalling the DVD drive, I'll need to remove the hard drive. This will just give us access for the temperature sensor wire to be able to be routed through to where it needs to connect to the logic board. I won't reinstall this hard drive as we'll be upgrading it with an SSD later. After attaching the DVD drive with its four screws, its temperature sensor wire can be connected into place. As for that hard drive we removed earlier, I'm going to remove its mounting hardware as this will need to be transferred to our new SSD. However, to mount it to the SSD, we'll need an adapter as the SSD is smaller than the original hard drive. After the mounting gear is attached, we can install the SSD into the bracket. It can then be reinstalled into the iMac using its two cables and two fastening screws. Just like that, we've updated this computer from a mechanical hard drive to a much faster SSD. Before we seal things up, I'm going to replace the CMOS battery just for good measure. After that's done, it's time to install our new working display panel into place. After attaching all four wires, we can carefully seat it down into position and install the eight Torx screws. As we're installing glass over the top, it's important to remove any dust, fingerprints or marks from the LCD panel itself before we attach it, otherwise it'll be trapped in between the two layers. After that's done, I could reattach the glass panel back into place. The last upgrade left is the RAM. I'll reinstall the original 4 gigs of RAM and add two additional 2 gigabyte sticks, bringing the total to 8 gigs. It can support up to 32 gigabytes, but I had this RAM laying around and 8 gigabytes should be enough. After installing the RAM door, it's time to test the computer. I'll also need to install an operating system on our new SSD. Thankfully, the computer is working flawlessly after the repairs and upgrades. Now, all that's left to do is give the computer a good clean. Starting with the display, I'll wipe it down with a microfiber cloth and some alcohol, 
before cleaning the rest of the computer with some alcohol wipes. It's always good practice to clean used electronics. This one didn't look too bad, but just after a light scrub, you can see the amount of dirt that came off. There was also a sticker in the top left hand corner, likely from some kind of asset tag, as this might have been used in a workplace or school at some point in its life. After cleaning that off, all that was left was the keyboard and mouse itself. After everything's cleaned off, we're done. So this is it, a 2011 iMac I received for free. After a new LCD and an upgrade to an SSD, an i7 CPU and 8 gigs of RAM, we have a nice little desktop with a great design that hasn't dated at all. My dad still uses a 2010 model of this iMac. It's had a suspected power supply fault ever since it was new that sometimes causes it not to boot after the power button is pressed. Instead, it just makes water droplet sounds for a few minutes until eventually kicking into gear and chiming. But given just how easy this one was to fix, I'll have to get his working better than it ever has. As for this iMac, what we're left with is a 2011 model with a 2.8 gigahertz Core i7 processor, 8 gigabytes of RAM and an AMD Radeon 6750M graphics card running macOS High Sierra. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the computer playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.